Welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You are, as always, with Mike. And the other fella. <laughs> My particular friend, Ian Bradley, as we are together rereading the Aubrey Matron series of Patrick O'Brien. Ian, we're in the last book, the last full book. We're coming up on chapter eight here. Bring us up to date, please, sir. Ah, with pleasure. Last time, the surprise had discovered a rebuilt, well-armed ASP. That's the, the ship under the command of our rival, David Lindsay. They had discovered this in Rio. They had, meanwhile, made it safely around the Horn, but had had some other mishaps along the way, along these dangerous coastlines, what with all the ice coming in early in this particular year. Fighting off scurvy, they had replenished their supplies with fresh seal and sea lion meat as a grave Captain Jack Aubrey had driven the ship north through the Pacific on her mission. This time, Mike, this chapter, well, it's been at least a whole chapter since we opened with a funeral, so we do that again. Hopefully, we'll get closer to the mission, this long-awaited mission, if only we can weather the weather, so to speak. Stephen considers his own contributions to the whole world of scientific knowledge. William Reed is brought up a little short. And this guy, Sir David Lindsay, makes an appearance. And we all get to quote some Shakespeare. So, Mike, there's quite a lot for us to get into here. That Help us out with the opening of the chapter, would you? Yeah. And as you say, you know, we've got Jack and those familiar words, as the text said. Once again, yeah. Jack reciting the Anglican burial rite, this time the body of the master, Henry Woodbine, going over the side. The Ringle, meanwhile, signals a potential Cape Pilar sighting about 35 miles ahead. In the cabin, Stephen offers Jack a cup of mauled claret with ginger, nutmeg, and cloves to dispel the cold. Jack says it goes down very nicely, and if anything could replace coffee, this might be it. So here's our first sign that we're still really low on supplies. Now coffee's gone, so we're mulling claret here. Yeah. And Jack is asking Stephen if he's heard the news here. Stephen's saying, you know, not me. I've been really busy in the sick bay. And he tells Stephen that the Pacific may well be just beyond Cape Pilar, which William says is, is about 35 miles ahead. Stephen replies, do you mean we may survive? And Jack says he wouldn't go quite that far, but he is asked. Yeah, yeah. This is this gave me a little bit of pause. I was like, "Whoa, okay, I understand." Grab a belaying pin, knock on wood. But all right, obviously, it's 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 a kind of a humorous way to tell us things have not gone well here, right? And Jack says, "I'm going to ask William to come dine with us. We'll compare their noon position with our noon position." And the text says, "Either rejoice or lament." as the case may be. So, wow, yet another ominous start to a chapter here with yeah. Henry Woodbine going over the side and wondering, at least perhaps a little tongue-in-cheek, whether we're going to survive or not. Indeed. And it had seemed, hadn't it, last chapter, like we'd weathered the storm and we were away up the Pacific, but no, there is still jeopardy, there's still danger along the way here. So a, a sad day for those close to Henry Woodbine, and sad day, of course, for him, a good day, though, for another member of the crew. And we were sort of remembering a couple of chapters ago how Midshipman Hansen had been given a bit of a step here because of his fictional sea time over the head of Mr. Daniel. Well, that little injustice gets to be righted. Jack calls for the acting master to attend him and says to Killick, have the cook prepare as decent a dinner as the barky can provide because Ringle, that is to say William Reed, is coming aboard. Jack asks Stephen if maybe the sick pay can contribute something for the dinner. And Stephen says, well, maybe a little bit of the portable soup and maybe I can get two or three bottles of decent wine from my own personal store. And in comes the acting master and God bless him, it's Mr. Daniel. So clearly Jack has been able to let Daniel leapfrog Hansen again to appoint Daniel as acting master, which is nice. I had a little leadership maneuvering here that I think is going to stand Jack in good stead, even if the reason why is a sad one. 
Jack says to Daniel that your first act as acting master will be to make a meticulously exact noon observation to confirm whether this reported sighting of Cape Pilar is correct. And might we remember a couple of chapters ago that Daniel was the one who was helping the American frigate's master figure out what was going on with their chronometer. So there's a lot of risk around your calculation of longitude, a lot of uncertainty, and we're counting on young Daniel to take great care of this calculation and to tell us whether we are finally in the Pacific or not. Meanwhile, he also says to Daniel, have Lieutenant Harding make all reasonable sail to close the schooner, to get in company with the Ringle here. And I, I love this next line. The sea, said Jack, if it teaches nothing else, does at least compel a submission to the inevitable, which resembles patience. And all those concerned contain themselves with a decent appearance of that virtue through the clear hours of approach. <laughs> I love a submission to the inevitable, which resembles patience. Right. I kind of wish I had that, but I don't think I do. Anyway, never mind. Everyone aboard the ship who knows anything about navigation is delighted to hear that the Ringle's position and the Surprise's positions coincide. And to learn furthermore, thank you, Stephen, there's a full-bodied burgundy to go with the seal steaks in the feast that follows in the gun room. And afterward, they all get topped up with American rum as well. So their supply position, Mike, is now looking pretty good. Jack calls up the midshipmen one by one, tells them to take particular note of the tall, naked mountain with two pillars of rock at the end of the island ahead. He says this is something they should remember. They should never forget that it marks the western end of the Magellan Strait and with a good wind should carry them through to the Atlantic in a week. So, Mike, right. this, is, this is all sounding like we're on the up again. After Cape Pilar, the weather is delightful. There's no cruel bite of ice. Health returns to many of the crew members, and the cats actually return from having hidden in the gallery where they've been seeking warmth the entire way around the horn. But, short-lived, a week later, there's an appalling drop in the barometer. The wind turns foul. All hands are called to bring the ship to and to veer out a drogue. A wave whips across their side, floods the galley, and puts out the fires. The pumps start and continue without a pause as they face weather as severe as anything they faced in the threat of the more deadly southern ice. Whoa. So, boy, the, these respites are very short-lived, Ian. Yeah, and this bad weather's continuing for more than just half a chapter as well, which is quite something. When it all finally blows out, Jack observes that Ringle had come through better than expected. She's missing headrails. She's missing parts of her bowsprit. She's got a suspiciously new yellow boom, but she looks more buoyant than the surprise. They go past shattered trees and masses of vegetation where it seems that steep land has been carried away with the trees and the boulders intact. Jack signals to Ringle, make what offing is feasible. That is to say, claw as far away from land as you think you possibly can and asks Harding here aboard the surprise to have the watch below to go below, to go get some rest, to get grog and smoked penguin and biscuit, and then turn in. And as Jack mentions the word biscuit, Harding gives him a severe glance. So, Mike, it sounds like all of our supply woes might not have completely gone yet. Right. So, there are fewer folks in the sick berth after this blow than Jack had perhaps expected, partly because there had been so few crew members remaining still uninjured following the rounding of the horn and those who had escaped injury then were the seamen who were pretty familiar with all these furious extremes of weather this is good news as far as jack's concerned and he's glad then to see that Stephen has been generous with the laudanum help with the severe pain i'm still worried though that Stephen's got plentiful supplies of laudanum aboard ship and so far from land but never mind Stephen says well i could still do with some brandy and here's the thing biscuit so Stephen and Lieutenant Harding are both aware of the shortness of the biscuit supplies. Jack says he can help with the brandy. That's after they go on deck and look at some curious trees. And there in the fading light, Stephen notices that some of these trees are enormous pines that have been completely uprooted. Whole hillsides have been torn away. And there's the risk that the trailing roots of these enormous trees could foul the rudder. So Mike, we could still be in Desolation Island territory in terms of the risk to the surprise here. So. It's a very tense moment. 
It, it really is. Jack wants to take Stephen away for his brandy now. And Stephen says, you know, have you noticed the air is turned curiously thick? And he decides that he's ex- completely exhausted. He's going to turn himself in. And in order to give himself a good night's sleep, he's going to dose himself with laudanum. Your your concern coming true here. And, <laughs> there we you know, go. I've been administering it very generously in the sick bay. I think I'll administer a little to myself here. Mm. And consequently, when Jack tries to wake him in the morning, Stephen really has no idea where he is, calls Jack a hideous ape, tells him to go to the devil, turns over at his cot, and covers his head with his pillow. Jack patiently continues to explain that a hall whaler is alongside them. And there's a man who's had a terribly mangled arm. It was caught in a harpoon rope and run out by a sperm whale. And he desperately requires medical assistance. Stephen coming to a little bit says, you know, he's no more fit to operate on a man than to bind up a cut finger, but then stops and says, what's that that I smell? And Jack says, ah, <laughs> it's the coffee that the whaler sent across. And he asked Stephen if he'd like to have some. And Stephen says that he does and immediately starts to look a little more human and intelligent. Ah, there's no, ah. nothing like a bit of moral disadvantage to wake a fellow up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. After several cups, Stephen asks Jack the name of his Loblolly boy. <laughs> and I think Jack is starting to realize what state Stephen is in. Right, right. Jack replies, Paul Skeeping. Is the sea calm? Asks Stephen. Mill ponds ain't in it, says Jack. And Jack says, you know, what, what should I do? Jack's worried Stephen's going to drop back off again here that this coffee's got him up for a minute. And Stephen says, send Paul across to the whaler. And as the text says, she will tell my poor stupefied mind what to do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it still seems to be touch and go as to whether Stephen Maturin is going to be able to stay awake and summon his right mind. But fortunately, Paul has no such handicap. She's away. She's back. And she reports that even St. Luke and all the apostles and all the surgeons of Dublin could not save this poor fellow's arm. But... Stephen might save the man's life by taking the arm off at the shoulder. So this is a pretty grim injury. She's told the whalers to get ready. She's gathered Stephen's supplies and instruments. And when Stephen has crossed between the two ships, he finds the patient fighting pain, fighting off as well, grief and dread. And at this point, the medically minded Stephen comes back to his true life, I think. He confirms the diagnosis that Paul had given, carries out the amputation, It seems to have gone really, really cleanly and soundly. The patient himself is surprised that it's all over and that he might have been spared. He blesses Stephen, the little Catholic hint here, and Stephen tells the ship's master how to care for this man who is his brother going forward for the rest of the voyage. Now, this is great. Stephen getting rescued from the depths of his laudanum slump by a medical emergency. And also, it's nice that they are whalers. We've kind of got a... A happy feeling, I think, about whalers in the Patrick O'Brien books. Jack goes on and tells Stephen how he has always liked whalers. They have to be good seamen, he says. They are generous. The whaler's master, besides giving over coffee, would willingly have emptied his hold for the surprise out of gratitude. But besides the coffee, Jack had only accepted a couple of casks of biscuits. Yep, biscuits. Once he had learned that there is also, in fact, a sheltered anchorage close by where they can get resupplied. It's a place frequented by whalers. It's called Pion, I think is how you pronounce it, Pion. And this place is run by another gentleman from Hull who, it turns out, is married to an Indian woman. So here we go. All seems to be fine. We've exchanged news. We've exchanged supplies. But there's more for us to find out, right, Mike? Yeah. Well, it's a couple of days later. I guess Stephen's been busy with his patients and, and the patient aboard the whaler and so busy that he had not during those intervening days dined with the master of the whaler and Jack and heard about fellow members of the Royal Society. One, Jack is telling him, Austin Dobson, an entomologist, had inherited perhaps millions from a distant cousin. He had bought the Lisbon packet and is traveling around the world with fellow royal members of different, you know, natural science specialities to gather and study specimens. They're currently working on the Chilean and Peruvian coasts. Well, Stephen honors Austin for the noble way that he's employing and enjoying his inheritance. 
And Jack says, you know, that the whalers had run into these guys in San Patricio and asked them all sorts of questions about whales and ambergris. Now, Ian, <laughs> this, you know, I, I thought this Austin Dobson, surely this is a historical reference. What do we find? Well, it's funny. I It set my antennae twitching a bit for two reasons. First of all, the Christian name Austin is pretty rare, except in, in my occasional acquaintance, genteel members of the Catholic fraternity in the northeast of England. And the other northeastern connection is Dobson. The name Dobson is really famous in the northeast. So uh, that sort of started me digging. So let me tell you where we got to. First of all, I went digging for this guy, Austin Dobson. There was no entomologist named Austin Dobson from the Northeast or from anywhere else at all. Digging back through the uh, online chat amongst the the fan base, hmssurprise.org, the gun room, seems to have reached a consensus that this character was a tribute to the English writer Henry Austin Dobson, 1840 to 1921. So Henry Austin Dobson, a, a bit later than our canon, but still the kind of writer that O'Brien might have come across. Now, this fellow, Henry Austin Dobson, had a day job as a civil servant, but had become a noted poet and biographer. And his biography subjects included famous 18th century writers of of classic POB types, like Fielding and Steele and Goldsmith. And intriguingly, another one of his biography subjects was the wood engraver and naturalist Thomas Buick, author of a famous book called History of British Birds, the kind of book as well that O'Brien might have had a copy of from the 18th century. Thomas Buick lived in the area in the surroundings of Newcastle for his whole life. So I wondered why Austin Dobson, the biographer, chose to write about Thomas Buick. Hang on to that idea for a second. Because we turn the page in the book, as I'm reading here, and Dobson from Newcastle wasn't a complete dead end. The rich cousin that is described here has some characteristics in common with the famous John Dobson, John Dobson, the architect who designed pretty much all of the grandest buildings in Newcastle upon Tyne, who is now now has a street named after him and was a fairly wealthy, perhaps not millionaire status, but a fairly wealthy man. John Dobson was born in my hometown of North Shields, died in Newcastle in 1865. He designed also, by the way, the plinth for the famous statue and monument to Admiral Lord Collingwood that we've talked about before. That's at Tynemouth. Um, he died leaving a fairly comfortable estate for the times of £16,000. Um, Newcastle at the time having been one of the most prosperous cities in the country at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So a decade or two out, 100000 or a million or two out in terms of the size of the inheritance. But I still thought maybe there's a connection there. I wonder whether... John Dobson and Henry Austin Dobson were some kind of a cousin, Um, whether maybe Patrick O'Brien had a copy of Buick's bird book on his shelf or had a copy of some of these other biographies written by Henry Austin Dobson and kind of pulled at the thread a little bit to make the connection with the other famous wealthy Dobson of Newcastle. Anyway, that was my pleasure, I think, in just digging for that. So I hope you've all enjoyed it the same as me. Meanwhile, Mike, I'm noticing that The dialogue in this chapter, which is written as if it's Stephen talking to Jack, it doesn't really read like Jack's in this conversation. This reads like two sides of Stephen Maturin talking to each other. There's a bit of a sort of just internal monologue dialogue going on here. What do you think? You know, I I think you're right. As Jack was describing to Stephen what these fellows of the Royal Society were about. Oh, they're about to go study the economical rat of those parts. I thought, Jack Aubrey never talks about the economical rat of those no. parts. You're right. This sounds more like Stephen to Stephen. But I, I guess since Stephen was not on the scene, O'Brien had to put the words in Aubrey's mouth to come back yeah, to it. Yeah. Was, I had a nice chuckle there hearing, hearing Jack talk like that here. Well, they weren't the only ones chuckling, or we weren't the only ones chuckling. Jack and Stephen have a laugh, too. We talked about they had asked the whalers about whales and ambergris. And when they mention this, Jack and Stephen start laughing, remembering that Stephen had once been lost on a coral island with a piece of ambergris as his only companion. The text says, why do we laugh? There was nothing droll about your situation or our anxiety, said Jack. Stephen says, well, perhaps because you found me, so it all ended happily. But to be sure, laughter is sometimes wonderfully obscure. Whenever my mind moves to that piece of ambergris, I feel the birth of a smile. So part of this 
Beautiful oh. O'Brien language here. Part of this touching relationship between Stephen and Jack here. Well, it's really great. <laughs> yeah, I just love it. Stephen hopes that they run into these members of the Royal Society as they make their way up the coast. He, he for one, would really like to know what they've found so far on their journey. Jack, meanwhile, is called away, and the idea of the wealthy Dobson can't really uh, leave Stephen B. He's thinking that, well, I came into a great inheritance, and although I don't have millions, I'm what most people would call tolerably wealthy. And that makes, sets him to thinking about the ways that he could advance science, but he's gone no further than thinking about them. The text says he had contributed nothing to the sum of knowledge. Some part of his mind had once offered a flood of denials, excuses, attenuating circumstances, assertions of his distinguished merit, his unbroken record of observing Lent as strictly as any man, not even in minor orders, but he remained low-spirited, and he was glad to see Jack reappear. And Mike, I, I too am glad to see Jack reappear, but I think Stephen's a bit down on himself here. He's presented papers to the Royal Society. I'm pretty sure he, he had at least the intention of founding a chair of comparative osteology when he came into his big fortune. I'm pretty sure he's written about the phenograms of upper ossery. So uh, either Patrick O'Brien is forgetful or he's just indulging in a bit of the blue devils on the part of Stephen Matcher in here and thinking, well, looking back at my life, I haven't done very much. I've only written 20 books of the finest historical fiction that ever kind right. of turned a page and I've only been in met Charlton Heston and eaten dinner aboard the HMS Victory. But apart from that, what have I ever done is perhaps what O'Brien is thinking. Right, right. I agree. Oh, Jack tells Stephen that he had left, he'd gone up on deck when they'd heard this noise, but everything's back in shape now. And that Daniel and Hansen are plotting their course for Pilon behind its protecting island, this place where they can resupply here. Jack says, I'm going to send Ringland for the supplies since there's this awkward turn in the channel that deep laden whalers avoid. So it might be a little bit tight for the surprise here. Jack doesn't want to risk the surprise and the text says that neither the whalers that frequent this, nor Jack, nor the Ringle know that this recent storm, along with a minor local earthquake, have now blocked that part of the channel and filled it with a massive rock slide below the surface. So not knowing that, Reed's taking the Ringle in. The Ringle runs straight on to these sharp-edged, new-fallen rocks when she puts her helm hard over to make the bend that he knew was coming. But what he didn't know was that it's filled with rocks here. Well, the text says that Reed is pale and shaken when he comes back in his gig from the schooner to report this to Captain Aubrey. Jack tells William, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Never mind. You lead the surprise in. You know, you go ahead of us in the gig, sound all the way. We're going to put our anchors out of stern and we'll try and heave the ringle off. And at high tide, indeed, they heave her off. But their cheers are silenced by the rise of all this broken woodwork from below, some of it copper-plated. So Jeez. they're really worried. They beach her on a smooth sea lion's nursery, and at low water, they find that the horrible wounds are not deadly. The carpenters and some skilled men from the settlement, I think feeling a little bit guilty, because they, they might have known a little bit more about what was here and didn't get the word out. Yeah. Also yeah. feeling guilty that they've been watching the women do all the, oh no, sorry, it's a different oh, settlement. But right, I did right, read this right. thinking, oh yeah, in the previous place, all the women were doing all the work. I'm pleased to at least hear that the men are willing to turn their arm over at something useful. Yeah. Thank goodness, not just grab yeah. blankets from naked old grandmothers in boats, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But together, all these guys get you know the Ringle at least into good enough shape to sail to a well-equipped yard and dry dock, which will bring her back into fighting form here. Indeed. Well, we're back again with Stephen writing about this in his serial letter back to Christine. He tells about how young William Reed, who is in no way to blame for the Ringles accident, and even on the say-so of Jack Aubrey, nonetheless is still walking around bent and weighed down with the guilt that he imagines. You poor fella. Nobody in the world is looking at this and saying, you should have seen this and looked ahead. It was an absolute accident. <sighs> Stephen, we learn, has prescribed for him. It sounds like he's diluting his laudanum stocks even further. And 
he hopes that they'll reach San Patricio and the shipyards soon enough to cure Reed from this melancholy because he says it's affecting everybody else. People on the Ringle, they shake their heads and clasp their hands when young William Reed walks by. Mm. And later on, Stephen signs off this letter as he's ready to go ashore with Captain Aubrey. And he's very droll in describing what his role is going to be. He takes me, he says to uh, to Christine, he takes me not as you may well suppose from my advice in sailing the boat, but merely for my ability to speak Spanish. Ha ha ha. He goes on to add that there's this ominous note about the town on this kind of uneasy shore because he notices that many of these local towns seem to have been destroyed by earthquake or fire or its opposite, a vast engulfing wave that seems connected with the earthquake and that not only destroys the ruins even more thoroughly, but will carry a ship, an 800-ton ship, up and through the town, sometimes setting it down as by a giant hand, upright on the debris. All this, he says, in addition to pest, plagues, and piratical raping. And, Mike, there's, between the plagues and the pest and the raping, that's, there's, there's quite a lot to worry about still here. Even, even though we thought we left the horn behind, it's fair to say that we're not out of the woods yet. Now, now I'm, I think I'm ready for a cup of that Delaware's rum. Let's take a pause. Amen, brother. <laughs> See you after the break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. So welcome back from the break. We hope you've managed to regain your composure. If you're composed enough that you're thinking about the seasonal gift giving opportunities that might be uh, before you right now, you could do little better than heading over to lubbershole.redbubble.com and seeing if you want to try a hand at any of our seasonal merch. We hope you enjoy it. And we promise we're not going to go on about this for too much longer. But if you want to get some merch, you know where to head to. Meanwhile, Mike, it, it's funny. I've spotted a connection between this chapter and last chapter. Last chapter, we were talking about icebergs. And we mentioned that O'Brien refers to them as mountains of ice, not icebergs, presuming that that's because the the term iceberg wasn't common. And similarly, in this chapter, we notice that he refers to tsunamis, not as tsunamis, but as, uh, what does he call it? Waves, a vast engulfing wave. Again, supposing that the, the word that we use nowadays wouldn't have been in common usage, at least not amongst Westerners at the time. And... We took a, a look into this to our old friend, our old online resource, Google Ngram. And it's certainly true that Tsunami has had very, very low or zero usage until probably the early 20th century, the 1920s. But Iceberg, it turns out, has actually had quite a lot more usage earlier in history. Certainly, according to Ngram, back as early as 1815. And, and Mike, as we look into it a little bit, it's probably been in use even before then, right? Right, right. It looks like this was a, a pretty straightforward pickup from a, a Dutch-German term yeah. that dates back much earlier that would sound like iceberg, having said it, which means literally ice mountain yeah. here. Now, it doesn't mean that Jack or Stephen would have known the word. Maybe Stephen might. We do know, however, that Frederick Marriott knew the word and used it in his 1831 book, Jacob Faithful, in a very long description of an encounter with an iceberg. Huh. Wow. Fascinating. Well, let, let's put the uh, the Engram chart and maybe a couple of the links out on the social media. So we're sorry we missed that in the last episode, but it's a really, really fascinating thing to dig into. And um, still, a tsunami is not a tsunami until the 1920s. Right. If you weren't expecting icebergs and you weren't expecting tidal waves, you probably also weren't expecting to see the Lisbon packet. And certainly the officers and crew of the Surprise weren't either. The barge comes up ashore in San Patricio, coming up to the confluence of the two rivers there, just as they get to the well-inhabited part of the town. And the coxswain says, by God, sir, there's the old Lisbon packet, painted blue. And I love how he repeats, painted blue. Jack points out this craft to Stephen 
and said, well, this is surely our fellows from the Royal Society, Dobson and his crew. Maybe we can go over and see them. And it is indeed they. Everybody's pleased to see one another. There's excellent lemonade to be had. And over a glass of that, they get into talking and they tell Stephen and Jack about their delights and their discoveries on this long scientific voyage. Finally, Jack says, I have to tear myself away here. Um, I need to take Stephen ashore to speak Spanish with the boatyard owners to talk about getting repairs done for the Ringle. The scientific voyagers there recommend Lopez's yard. They say it's the second on the right, just past the first yard, which, (gasps) ominous mention, is occupied by the Chilean Navy. So... I, I think despite what Lover's Hole Bingo players might say in protest, Mike, we've got to say, stick a pin in, the Chilean Navy is nearby. Right. <laughs> Too true. Well, Jack and Stephen are making their way along, perhaps not as quickly as Jack would like. Stephen is trying to make out a number of species of birds, one particular long-necked crane-like bird, and he had left his telescope behind. So it's taking longer than usual. And at one of these stops, they hear someone calling out Aubrey's name, asking if he's looking for the asp. And we're thinking, oh, wait, he was looking at and for the asp before. He didn't expect it here, expected it in Rio. Yeah. And Jack turns and greets, bum, 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 <laughs> Sir David Lindsay. Yeah, well, finally, here he is. Jack says, no, you know, I'm not looking for the asp. I'm looking for the Lopez yard. And Lindsay points out where the yard is and says, you know, do you not know the town? And Jack says, no, he's, he's just arrived in this town for the first time. And the little time he spent here is spent drinking lemonade with the fellows from the Royal Society. And Lindsay says, well, Aubrey must have been in very much a, at sea in that learned company. You know, I'm thinking, Ooh, what? <laughs> very much at sea in that learned company. And, and Jack thinks that his slight acquaintance with Lindsay does not a warrant Lindsay's familiar tone with him. Jack then turns and introduces Stephen in the text as, may I introduce my political advisor, who is also a fellow, yeah. Dr. Matron. <laughs> Dr. Matron, Sir David Lindsay. And uh, you know, Matron says, your servant, sir. Lindsay replies, your servant, sir, somewhat confused. And then to Jack, he says, should you like to look at Asp? She is just across the way in the naval basin. So as you say, it, oh, wait, just across the way. Whoa, so she's in the Chilean Navy now. I love the way that Jack Burns Lindsay pointing out that both Definitely. he and Matron are fellows of the Royal Society, implying that they were not at all at sea in that conversation. And then founding <laughs> Lindsay pointing out that here he is with his political advisor, Dr. Matron here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have a ship, I have a ship, and I also have a political advisor. So I'll see you, raise you. You know, <laughs> are you still in the game here? That's um, right. It, it's fascinating, partly because it's funny, partly because it's these two people squaring off, waving their kind of manhoods at each other, right? and partly because we're a long, long way from home. And I bet that maybe Jack is just huffing and puffing, but I bet Stephen's mind is turning over here with what could be going on. Meanwhile, Lindsay gets to point out the changes that we had heard about back in Rio, right? The changes to the construction of the ASP. As we had heard, she is longer. There are more guns to each side. Jack doesn't make any comment on the changes that Lindsay has made. He clearly thinks better of some of them. He only says that the ASP must have made a remarkable passage. He's talking about how they made it here so fast. And Lindsay replies to this, Good God, yes, but I was in a hurry. And as you know, I've never been afraid of cracking on, so I took the straight. Ah, okay. Jack came round the outside, round the horn. Lindsay took the straight of Magellan. Back with Lindsay's quote here. Some people say it is dangerous and prefer to creep round by the horn, but I don't mind a little danger, and I took the straight. At one point, just after the second narrows, when we were very nearly close hauled, the wind began to back before we were handsomely round the cape, and with tears in his eyes, the master begged me to put into the sheltered bay. But no, said I, in for a penny, in for a pound, and we rounded the point with barely a fathom to spare. And my, I can just, I can hear Jack Aubrey's teeth grinding. I can see the little jets of steam coming out of his ears. 
not only because of the kind of vainglorious posturing from this guy, David Lindsay, but this is not a million miles away from Jack Aubrey. You know, Jack has weathered capes at biscuit toss in his time. And Lindsay might not just be a blowhard. He might be a Jack Aubrey kind of a blowhard. And yeah, it, it, even so, the characters of the two captains couldn't be more different. O'Brien is really astutely drawing the distinction between them most especially in the fact that Jack is in a position of some authority and he's not overdoing his own claims and he's not blustering in his own terms. Jack had been prudent. I, I think we're not meant to doubt that at all. Jack had been prudent the way he came round the horn, not chancing the straight. He hadn't risked the life of his crew. Lindsay had gone against all advice, or all against prudent practice and seamanship, coming through the strait and surviving with only a fathom to spare. But what a really, really great moment. I love this. Yes, for sure. Well, Jack replies, well done, only because he feels he's required to. The text makes it clear. Yeah. And Lindsay just stands there relishing the feet and murmuring, in for a penny, in for a pound. You know, it's like, oh, what a great phrase. And I, I love it. O'Brien sets him up. He says, he keeps repeating that to himself. It's still one of these birds that Stephen's been looking at craps on his hat. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> Lindsay grabs something, rubs off the bird poop, and, and then kind of puffs himself back up again and says, well, he's inspected all of his naval bases, all the ones under his command. And he says he has to tell Aubrey that discipline Elementary cleanliness and seamanship are, as the text says, not what what we could wish. That is one of the many reasons why I am so happy to have a man like you of your reputation under my orders. Uh, Whoa! Oh my goodness! Which way is this going to go here? Well, he, here's Jack with his comeback. What you say is particularly kind and flattering said Jack, after a considering pause and a glance at the holy impassive Maturin. By the way, I just love St the idea of Stephen's deadpan here. He's like, I'm not getting involved in this. But, says Aubrey, I am afraid there has been a misunderstanding. As a post-captain on the active list, which I'm sure is kind of in, in conversational italics because Lindsay has been neither of those things lately. As a post-captain on the active list on detached service, I am under the orders of the Admiralty and of nobody else on earth. Yeah, okay, Jack. Lindsay reddened, and after two false starts, he said, I am Commander-in-Chief of the Hunter's Naval Forces, and as such, how do you mean Hunter? The combination of authorities that make up the Republic. The Republic of the whole country? Uh, the entirety, uh, apart from a few dissident northern bases near the Peruvian frontier, that will soon be liberated. And as such, went on Lindsay, resuming his official voice, it is within my power to press your men and impound your vessel. And thank heavens for Stephen Maturin, who decides that this is the moment to just prevent Jack from steaming up altogether. Gentlemen, said Dr. Maturin, in a voice that expressed neither authority nor impatience, but that did stress the need to speak in a lower more adult tone and to abandon rhetoric and he goes on and says gentlemen it's time for us to sit in the shade to get something to drink and to talk and this is a great intervention by Stephen. I, I was kind of hoping for a bit more of a showdown to get all the way through here with jack and Lindsay, but never mind they get a cup of coffee they start talking as Stephen had asked like ordinary human beings and by some miracle they get back to talking just lighthearted stuff about shared acquaintances, about the ships that they knew that were still in commission, about friends thrown on the shore. And Jack again names Stephen as his political advisor. And Stephen sees that perhaps Lindsay's not as much of a fool as they had both first thought, and in turn lays out from his perspective the position here in Chile as seen by the ministry in London. So Mike, I, I don't know whether to be completely happy that Stephen intervened or slightly like I've been done out of my big showdown between Jack Aubrey and Sir David Lindsay here. Well, certainly if Lindsay's history is anything to use to predict the present or the future, I think if he and Jack had continued, somebody would have been calling out somebody else pretty oh, quickly. Yes. Yeah, oh, that yes. could have been kind of a bit of wicked. And Stephen really is in his element here. You know, Stephen points out the government 
meaning the ministry in London, is in favor of Chilean independence. It does not care much for some of the members of the Southern Junta, or Juntas, and has not committed itself to anything near recognition. It says government is on much better terms with the independent seekers in the North. <laughs> so this, these ones, that these outliers that, that Sir David Lindsay has been talking about, it says, in fact, there's been some communication and a certain understanding with the North. And Stephen continues, and the text says, but if any vexation, let alone any violence, were offered to a ship even remotely connected with the Royal Navy, the effects on Chilean independence would be disastrous. Disastrous, he repeats. Whereas a more or less tacit cooperation in suppressing Spanish privateering or the like, to say nothing of Peruvian invasion, would have entirely the opposite effect. Yeah. Text continues, so David, this is Stephen talking to him, was no doubt perfectly aware of Surprise's force, her fighting reputation, her superbly well-trained crew, her prime and ostensibly function was hydrographical, above all surveying, but in the course of her activities, she may well have many and many a chance of helping the infant republic to full and acknowledge independence. If Sir David would like to make all of these facts clear to the many influential men with whom he was in contact, he would do both countries a very great service indeed. And I'm yeah. thinking, oh, Stephen, <laughs> well done, man. This is, you know, we, we teach a lot about negotiating and Stephen has really done a beautiful job with positions <laughs> and interests here <sighs> of both the English government Lindsay, his superiors, the surprise, and Jack. And as a consequence, O'Brien tells us, they part with expressions of goodwill. Lindsay assuring them of the most wholly discreet cooperation in the case of need. Yeah. Mm, not, not sure <laughs> if I really buy that, but I think, Stephen, well done. Oh my gosh, what, what a difference a few moments make. And I love the difference in perspective here between Jack and Stephen, because this was, we've been talking all along about how we've been in Stephen Matcherin world for a long time, but all of a sudden we're in Jack Aubrey world and we've got a little bit of a hint of the old impetuous Jack and Stephen can see it and Jack can't. In fact, Jack asks Stephen as they walk away, how could Lindsay be so crazy, so wildly deluded as to think that he, Jack Aubrey had come to join and serve under Lindsay. Jack, meanwhile, agrees with Stephen that Lindsay doesn't appear to be a complete fool, but nevertheless, Lindsay seemed to believe what he was saying to Jack. And, as Jack goes on, to believe that even in peacetime, a post-captain quite high on the list and not reduced to actual beggary should consent to act in such a wholly unauthorised caper and to serve under him, it passes imagination. <laughs> so, again, Jack believes that the whole world behaves like a well-oiled navy in in his mold and cannot conceive of a circumstance in which somebody with Lindsay's you know position would even remotely think that jack would would, would kind of line up alongside him but mike steven's got i think a potentially deeper penetration of what might be going on here right yeah, and, and I love the way he handles it. First, he wants to, you know, assuage Jack's feelings. So he says, I have no idea why Lindsay would think that that would be the case. You know, Stephen goes on to say, can't even come up with a hypothesis. But he says that a line does kind of come to his mind. And he quotes it to Jack. Jockey of Norfolk, be not so bold, for Dickon thy master is bought and sold. And I'll... I'll pause right here for a second to say that's it's a line from Shakespeare's play Richard the Third. In the play, it's a note that's left on John Howard's tent, John Howard, the first Duke of Norfolk, warning him that his master, King Richard, is about to be double crossed, which which he oh. is. And so I think Stephen's kind of, you know, he's setting Jack up a little bit here, because a few yards later, Stephen tells Jack, and the text says, I've had a certain experience with Hunters, and I must say that quite often those combinations for a common aim bring out the worst in men. They generally having private ends in far greater mass than the common aim. So that these guys who come together for these causes 
often are really kind of looking out for themselves. So Stephen goes on. Yeah. And Jack, it is my belief that you too have been bought and sold. Some considerable member of the Northern Junta that first approached you having defected to the South and having transferred your services as he might those of a common mercenary to his new friends. But, he says, I speak very much at random and must submit my notions to Jacob's vastly superior local knowledge and connections. I hope to see him in Santiago, but meanwhile, we have done no harm. End of chapter eight. That's very cool. I, I love it. It's funny. I've I've been thinking for the last two or three chapters, this is all okay, but things are kind of coming and going a little easily and we're a bit deep in the world of Stephen Maturin and his letters to Christine. This is great because Stephen's absolutely dead on. We have no way of knowing whether actually Lindsay is, despite his own ignorance and lack of official support, whether Lindsay might actually now be in the driving seat. Stephen says, we have done no harm, and that's kind of true, except for the enormous harm done now to Jack Aubrey's hopes of being unyellowed, right? He's still flag sick here. So I, I, I love the end of this chapter. The, the book is now getting to a nice boil, I think. What, what do you think? Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm like you, Ian. I, I thought to myself, what a fine kettle of fish we find ourselves in now. Like yeah. you, it's like, oh man, now we're definitely back on story. And to your point, and I think it's a great point. I mean, this can't go well either way. So apparently it sounds like the Southern hunters have taken over much of the country. Yeah. They're kind of on the side of independence. Indeed, Lindsay is their guy. That's the guy they picked. Jack was picked by the folks in the North. And Stephen has managed a little bit of a detente here. And if Jack, acting under government orders, all of a sudden teams up under Lindsay, that's contrary to his orders from the ministry. Yeah. And if he's trying to earn his flag in some meritorious act, doing it as second in command to Lindsay isn't going to do anything for him. Certainly Ooh. fighting a battle against Lindsay isn't going to do anything for him. No, much as he might personally enjoy doing it. <laughs> right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And might, with you know, without Stephen collaring him a little bit, might have done exactly that. Oh, I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried because, all right, now it seems like we've got a little bit of a detente, but boy, like I said, I'm I'm not sure I believe Lindsay when he says, Oh, don't worry. Oh, yes. Well, I'm all I'm all calmed down now. I mean, this is a guy that was calling people out for duels, even the you know, his admiral above him. Yeah. And right now, Ringle appears to be grounded. She's got to be repaired. Surprise and her men have been, you know, kind of decimated by this journey. They're not at great fighting strength. And I suspect that they can all use some recovery time here. Uh, and that, you know, maybe surprises in need of repair too. Lindsay, who historically has had no respect for authority, follows his own advice and now right. works for this kind of group that government saying, you know, we're a little suspicious about some of those guys. Stephen saying, you know, I think a lot of them are out for their own ends even more than they are for Chilean independence. And I'm wondering if these northern bases that, that Lindsay plans to liberate are under Chilean control or under the control of the folks that hire Jack and that Jack's trying to go meet up with. So yeah. I, I was just thinking, wait a minute, this could be, uh, and, and, and all of these situations in my mind, to your point, Ian, don't lead to meritorious recognition for Jack. Don't lead to blue at the mizzen, which I'm kind of hoping for as the title of this book. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. It's become more like a John le Carre book. Yes. Yeah, because it's all because we're no longer formally at war with France, e even on a, an mission directly under Admiralty orders. When Jack finds himself in the situation, he can't simply say, "I am commanded by Person X to do this to Person Y," and fail not, nor should he answer to the contrary at your peril, because there there isn't war anymore, and he's going to have his influence in this local conflict kind of indirectly. It's really, really fascinating. Like you say, Mike, Lindsay promises discreet cooperation. We don't know how much faith to put in that. The Southern Hunters might be competing under themselves. We might, J Jacob's intelligence from earlier might be still valid or something new might have come along here. 
We, we don't know whether the surprise can get repaired. We've got Lindsay and Aubrey on the scene now to compare and contrast with each other, not only to disagree and potentially fight with each other, but to give us two different versions of the Navy to see which one is going to win in the end. Stephen, meanwhile, is slap bang back in his preferred role of political intelligence and advising, trying to smooth over the differences and the bad blood here. We're hoping, of course, that Ringle gets repaired. We're hoping that Jacob is going to come back on the scene with some information. Mike, two chapters left in this, the last full book of the Aubrey Maturin canon. And there's still only one thing for it. What do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, I should like that of all things. So feeling guilty that they've been watching the women do all the... Oh, no, sorry. It's a different oh, settlement. Right, but I did right, read this right. thinking, oh, yeah, in the previous place, all the women were doing all the work. I'm pleased to at least hear that the men are willing to turn their arm over at something useful. Thank goodness. Not just grab blankets from naked old grandmothers in boats, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah.